Welcome again to one of my tutorials, video tutorials for the Gamma Optimizer Room. This time I am going to do something different to what I usually do here. Uh, this is actually a real class. This is going to be like a formal class for those of you that are new to options or in fact you could also be option experts but you want to dig deeper into the concepts of volatility and why volatility is such an important concept in the world of options. I mean, I, I haven't told you yet, but trading options uh, is trading gamma, which is also trading volatility. And in one of my uh, previous presentations, in the one about uh, gamma, long gamma in general, about the properties of gamma, I mentioned that Volatility, in fact, could be a proxy for price, and, and, and in general, in the professional world, options are always price and volatility units. So let's try to dig into this. I mean, this is going to be a fun class, I hope so, and it's going to be very long, so I'm going to split this into short videos, hopefully, but this thing is going to take quite some time because this is, it's an important concept, and... And I want you to really understand the concept. I want you to really master it. So in this first class, this first class is going to be like, <laughs> like the baptism by fire type of thing. I mean, I'm going to throw everything at you, the kitchen sink and everything. You're going to be hit really hard. But the idea is once we get over this um, formal stuff, we can start digging into the little pieces in a more meaningful way and a more accessible way. So bear with me in this first class because I'm going to use fancy words and I'm going to use uh, mathematics. So don't be scared and I hope you have fun. So the title of this series of lessons is called Everything You Wanted to Know About Volatility But Were Afraid to Ask. As usual, that's my laughable attempt at humor. So, to illustrate the importance of volatility in the options world, I'm going to start with the most common rookie mistake. I mean, accept it, you know, be honest with yourselves. We all, all of us have made this mistake. If you haven't made it yet, uh, congratulations to you, more power to you. But I mean, this is one of the most basic errors that everyone that is new to the world, world of options makes. So this is a very interesting scenario. This today is the earnings release for a certain company after the closing bell. And I know, I am sure the, the stock will go up and I want to play the earnings with the options because options are cheaper than buying the shares. So, so you know what? I'm going to buy the 105 call option that expires in one week from now and it cost me 460. The stock is trading 100. So if this thing goes over 105, I'm going to make some money, hopefully tomorrow, because there are still six days on the option. So, so call options are supposed to appreciate in price if the underlying moves up. So yes, yeah, earnings are great, fantastic. I hit jackpot, the, the stock goes to 108. It opens at 108 the next day. It's an 8% move. That's a gigantic move for a stock. And then I'm going to sell my option and what? It's value at 335. What the heck? I just lost 125. What happened there? Why did we lose money on this trade? We were supposed to make money. The call option is, is supposed to make money, yet it didn't make that much money. In fact, we lost money. So what happened? We were right, we lost, what happened? So, okay, one explanation is, oh, evil market makers, these guys are evil, they just want to steal your money. But that's not the real answer. The real answer is that on earnings date, the implied volatility of the options is through the roof. Now, this is very common. And if this stock was some kind of high beta stock, the what you guys now, the youngsters call the fangs, like Facebook or Alphabet and you know Netflix, whatever of these uh, uh, stocks that are hot, those stocks... Uh, move a lot after earning so option dealers will jack up implied volatility a lot and what happens is once the earnings event is out of the window while well, everything is back to normal then implied volatility collapses back to normal and it affects the price of the option it affects the price of the option so much that you are losing money so what happened here is the volatility collapse age your money that's it we lost money because volatility 
weighing against us. So hopefully this lesson that we have all <laughs> endured uh, stay with us for a while. So as you can see from this example, there is a tremendous connection between volatility and price. It, 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 the connection is so huge that at some conceptual level, it could be argued that price and volatility are basically the same thing. So the question re remains, so then what is volatility? How can we measure it? No, see, what is this concept first and second? Okay, now I understand the concept, but how can I just measure? How do I know what the volatility of an option is? In order to understand that, we need statistics. There is no way around, guys. I cannot tell you this tale uh, using beagles or trees and flowers. I need to, to talk about statistics. The funny thing is, volatility is actually an statistic, no? Yet, if you open a book about statistics, you will never see it there. I mean, I, I, I dare you to find the reference a reference to volatility on any test book about the statistic. And that's something that I always uh, I, I find really funny because volatility is a is a domain word. I mean, it's a word used in a very specific domain, which is the world of economists or finance. So only financial type of people, only economists talk about volatility. But you will see later on that volatility is actually a very familiar concept, just that it was renamed for some reason. It was renamed. So in order to understand volatility, let's start with a tale of two worlds. I mean, it's very interesting how we can have the same underlying data and the same data can be represented in vastly different ways. For example, you are traders. The, the, the concept that you as traders are more familiar with is the concept of price because after all, that's what you're doing. Now you're buying and selling stuff and uh, well, that's what we are doing. I am buying and selling stuff too. But in general, a trader is very familiar with price. And and if you can look at history of things, you can see historical prices. I mean, I, if I am following a particular underlying, I could uh, access a historical database and see the prices from like 2010 until now and plot the prices on a nice chart. Uh, when you do that, that's what is called a time series. It's a series of data points in time. So I could just basically get the price of the S&P 500 every day since January 1st from 2010. And that's my time series. As a time series from 2010 up to now, and it represents price. So I'm going to show you two charts. And they, believe me, they represent exactly the same thing. Uh, but they look incredibly different. Those are the two charts. The chart on the left is the one that you are used to, is the chart of price. So, and you recognize now that's the S&P 500. I mean, this is an incredibly bull, bull market. I mean, Avi will be happy to tell you that this is a bull market. Um, as you can see, you know, this is basically a, a, a line with a very positive slope that is coming up. So it started kind of low, low 1000s and now we are uh, almost mid 2000s. It's incredible. I mean, the power of this uh, bull market. So the chart on the left is a very familiar chart. I didn't put a title to challenge you, but I, I'm giving you away. This is the S&P 500. And the chart on the right is exactly the same thing. Uh, I mean, I put it in red just to kind of like trick you. But in fact, it's the same thing. It's the same chart. It's just it has been transformed. And you can notice a couple of things between the two, between the two charts. Uh, in, on the chart on the left, which is price, price seems to keep always going and going and going up. However, the chart on the right, which is a, the price represented as a return, the return seems to be oscillating all the time. I mean, you can see it as, an, as a kind of signal that kind of stays on a level. You can see here this uh, some kind of stays in a level and it kind of oscillates back and forth around the same level. And sometimes you have some peaks, you know, and for those of you that are really observant, those, those, those kind of peaks coincide, in particular to the downside, coincide with like terrible moments on the market you know, in 2011, or for instance, uh, last year when we got that tremendous fall. And the same thing with the spikes up. You can see those were days where the market moved up a lot. But in general, notice how when price is represented in this way, it becomes kind of more useful. 
uh, and it becomes it, it is a representation that is that that gives us a lot of information. For instance, we can see the returns tend to be always return to the mean, which is actually a very interesting property. That's what most people call mean mean reversion. So you notice the return. It doesn't matter if it goes really far away; it kind of comes back far away. It comes back. You know, it tries to stay around the mean. However, price doesn't do that. I mean, price is like what to the moon. No, it's just like a rocket taking off. So very interesting word. No, so I'm just kind of summarizing, and this is like what I just said. It's exactly the same. Uh, the one on the left is easy to recognize, and and they are displaying the same information for the S&P 500 since January 2010. So the question remains. The question becomes now: Okay, the chart on the right, which is very interesting, nice, oscillating to, is a chart of returns, but more exactly, is a chart of log returns. Uh, Okay, so what is a log return? No, <laughs> so to, to understand a log return, we need to understand a normal return. So a normal return, what is a return? In finance, uh, price is nice, but people in finance and in econometry and statistical economy in general, they don't like price. They prefer something called returns. Returns is kind of like the centerpiece of all of the analysis that you do. In the most basic form, a return is just defined, you know, it's like when you compute the return of your investment. There's a final price minus an initial price divided by initial price. And if you want to express it as a percentage, you kind of multiply the thing by 100, no? And and I hope that this equation is very familiar to you, to all of you guys. You know, when you say, oh, I make 40% on this trade, that's what it means. No, it was a 40% computed like this. In finance, you know, the finance people, they prefer to use log returns. And there are many reasons why log returns are used. <laughs> I will go over them once we go to that particular section of the class. But right now, just let's just define what a log return is. A log return is just the logarithm, it's a, the mathematical function logarithm, the logarithm of the final price divided by the initial price. That's it. So it's kind of easier to compute. And if you wanted to express it, and I didn't put it here on the slide, I forgot, sorry about that. If you want to express this, you want to express this as a percentage, just multiply it by 100. So the log return is, is, is done like that. If you have a calculator of Excel, you can just uh, do some tests that the log return and the return will give you basically the same answer for a small values you now for 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 things that are up to like 20 to like 50 percent i will say they will be very similar the return and the log return will be very similar they just start to differ uh if the moves are very big or if the moves are really negative because log returns tend to be smaller to the downside and that, that that's that's the liberty that's the reason we use log returns because we if price falls, we don't want the log returns to be too big. So that's why we use logs as opposed to the normal returns. So the plot is log returns. Here I, I come back to the to the plots. And and as I, I was telling you, log returns have more useful statistics. If I compute the mean of both time series, the mean is just the statistical mean. What is the mean? It's just the average. It's I take all of the values, I add them, and divide by the number of values. You know? So if I do that with the price time series, like the normal price time series, you notice that the mean price of the stock market since 2010 until now is 1,669 with 96. And that's it. It is useless. How is that useful to us to know that the mean price since 2010 uh, is 1,669? It's useless. It has no use whatsoever. Why? Because as you can see in the chart, price is not mean reverting, contrary to popular belief. I don't know why. I mean, I have read this written so many times in so many places that prices mean reverting, like when? <laughs> we were at 666 in 2009, and we are at 2,350 now. When is the next time we are going to hit 669? I mean, if, if, your, if your time frame is infinite, if you say, oh, in a hundred years, we are going to be at 669, okay, you know, but uh, 
but it's not quite mean reverting. It's not really mean reverting. In fact, it's the opposite of mean reverting. Price in the stock market is what we call non-stationary. It just goes in its own. No? Like it doesn't remain bounded to a region. It just kind of goes. So that's why using statistics in price is completely useless. You don't want to use the statistics on price because there is nothing useful you can infer. This is um, this is a shock to most people that when you hear this because most of the trading software does that. You know, when you hear about the boiling engine bands and all of these other statistical things, they apply to price. So it's, it's not that I'm telling you that it's useless, but I mean in general it is. It is very useless. The the trick with these statistical indicators that are, are favored by many of you is that they kind of work in a very small time scales. So if you look here, it like there is there is this period of time where the market seems to be oscillating around a point. So maybe around this period of time, the statistics were useful because the market was kind of stationary in this period of time. But here, from 2012 to 2014, any statistics were useless because the market just drift higher. So so this the, this kind of like price statistics. Uh, are depend on the regime you are. Of course, if you go into a smaller time scales like intraday or just for the week, then maybe you have some prices more stationary in one week and it could be more useful. But in general, in price, please don't use the statistics. But now, let's switch to the chart on the right. The chart on the right is the log returns. The log returns are stationary, they just oscillate around this and look at the mean. The mean is actually really helpful right here because it's telling us that the mean daily return of the market since 2010 has been positive 0.04 percent. It, it gives you an idea right there that the market in average every day since 2010 has moved up 0.04 percent. This is telling you something very interesting. It's telling you that A, this is a bull market. Why? Because we have a consistent positive return, an average positive return every day. And it also gives you an idea about the expected value of the re daily return. So what is the daily return of SPX tend to be around that value at 0 0.04? It's a small positive, quanti uh, small positive quantity. A few times you have deviations from it you see there are deviations, but most of the time you tend to oscillate around that. So it's kind of a very useful statistics. Using the statistics in log returns is actually useful and it provides you with useful actionable information. So, uh, well here's a, as again, a summary of what I was talking. The pure price areas is not stationary, so statistics are not useful. The log return is actually a transformation of that series, uh, and it's a transformation that is done to remove the non-stationarity, so it becomes a stationary. And because of that, we can compute meaningful mean, a standard deviation, a skew, kurtosis, and any other statistic that you want to compute on the time series. Of course, at this point, I refer to you to your basic textbook of statistics. If you don't know what the mean standard deviation of skew or kurtosis are, just go take a look at your book or Wikipedia. I will talk about all of them. I mean, I am going to go walk you through this holding your hand, but right now you could have a deep dive and, and try to see, okay, what is mean? What is a standard deviation? So those are the statistics and those statistics can be performed on log returns as opposed to price. So then what is volatility? We arrive to the crux of this lesson. So finally, as a formal definition, this is the definition that you will read in any serious book. Volatility is just the standard deviation of the log returns. With the, the, the what is the name, with the twist, no? The twist of it is that it, those log returns are a scale, always a scale, so it represents an annual percentage. So it's showing you the standard deviation for one year. But it's, the, it's always a scale for that. Why? I don't know. I guess 
makes it useful to to all agree in one scale. So when you say, oh, the volatility of the market is 14%, you know that you're talking about 14% per year. And then some other person say, yeah, but it's yesterday it was 12, and then you know it was 12% per year. So, so it's good to agree about the time frame because you know, you know, we are talking the same language. So volatility is a standard deviation, uh, and in particular is the standard deviation of the log returns, and it's a scale in such a way to always represent an annual presentation and we speak the same language. So, so here we have it, you know, we have this fancy word and suddenly it becomes something simple because it's, well, simple quotes, uh, because volatility is just a standard deviation. Is and the standard deviation is a concept that you actually can find on textbooks, on a statistics textbooks. So it's something that you can go and investigate and research until the next lesson. However, of course, you know you want to know what <laughs> this means in plain English. Well, for that you have to wait. But so I, do, I am not that evil. I'm going to tell you in plain English. The standard deviation of log returns or volatility is a measure of dispersion. It's a measure of how far from the mean the time series goes. For instance, I'm going to show you right here, just, just this a little peek uh, from the next lesson. Do you notice that the mean is this green line? The standard deviation is a way to quantify in this distribution how far away we go from it most of the time. That's what a standard deviation is. It's a way to quantify. If because of um, look look at here because we went really far away, this period of time will have a high standard deviation. But in this period of time here, where it just kind of oscillates nicely, the standard deviation is going to be smaller. So volatility is going to be smaller in this area. Here a little bit more. So you can. You can see something here from the market now that we know what volatility is. We can say that, that from 2010 up to the end of 2012, the market was in a period of a high volatility. And you can see here the market was having really high deviations from the mean. Then for some reason, <laughs> we had a few years of nothing happening, a few years of very low volatility in the market in this region, and then towards the end of 2015, volatility returned to the markets briefly, and we are here in 2016 where volatility seems to be non-existent. I mean, in this period here since 2016 started, we have just like one peak, but then do you notice that volatility is kind of getting, getting lower, we are getting closer to this line. So. That's why the log return graph is so helpful. From this price chart, you cannot say anything about it. What can you say from here? Nothing. You can, the thing you can say from this chart is, oh, price went up. That's it. But here you can actually have a very interesting qualitative and quantitative discussion about the market. So this is it, folks, for now. This is the first lesson. I really hope that it was understandable. Uh, please, if you have questions, don't hesitate to ask them. I plan to publish the second lesson as soon as possible. Thank you very much.